Good morning. It's good to have you with us today. And we're in Matthew chapter 7. We've been working through for about 10 months now the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. And we're in the last chapter of this, um, this sermon Jesus gave. And we're in Matthew chapter 7 this morning. And we come to an interesting place in this sermon. And it's a place that has caused many problems and struggles. Much of these problems happen because people approach this passage in a manner they would not any human conversation. They come to this passage positioned near the end of the Sermon on the Mount and treat it as though it were its own sermon. As though it were disconnected from everything around it. You cannot understand one part of the sermon apart from the rest of it. Imagine if you were, came into a movie, a two-hour movie, with 30 minutes left in the movie. Do you think you would understand everything that was going on? No! Do you want to be sitting next to the person that comes into the movie with 30 minutes left? And you're, you're trying to get the movie wrapped up, and they're asking all these questions. Now, who is that? Now, why are they upset? Well, it's going to like, if you would just watch the whole movie, right? And sometimes we do that with Scripture, especially with this passage. So to catch us up, Jesus has spent this passage, this whole sermon, addressing his followers, his disciples. People coming to him, leaving behind their own way of life to learn from him how to think and how to live. People that are now the children of the Father. The children of God. In just the last few verses alone, He has taught us not to worry about the needs of life, but to trust our Father to provide. He has told us to seek first the kingdom of God, not our own kingdom, and not the kingdom of this world. He just told us the last week, in the last two verses, that we are to examine our own lives, to examine our own selves closely for sin and brokenness and failures. And once we find them, to deal with them. And so this passage today cannot be understood without keeping these things in mind. So with these things in mind, Jesus continues. Ask and it will be given unto you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will, the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Many of you hear those verses, and there's a thought that's going through your head right now. There are questions running rampant through your mind. And you're thinking, but pastor, we asked. We trusted, we prayed, we asked, and God did not respond. We asked and we did not receive. We sought and we did not find. And we knocked and the door was never open. And now your faith is shaken. Why pray? Why trust? And if you are truly honest, your faith isn't just shaken in prayer. Your faith is shaken in God. And much of it has to do with the passage that is before us this morning. And you say, well, what do we do, Pastor? You stop interrupting Jesus. See, Jesus didn't just give two verses and then stop. He's preaching a sermon. And we keep interrupting Him... And not let him finish the sermon. So let's let him finish the sermon. Or which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, will give him a serpent? Or if he asked for a fish, or if asked for bread, will give him a stone? And if he asked for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, word evil there means pain ridden, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more for your, will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Father, we come before You today. And Lord, we're, we're going into a challenging subject, a, a topic that has 
brought as much questions as perhaps any in Scripture for those truly seeking to follow you. And, and as we look at these passages, Lord, I pray that you would mend those who are hurting over this issue, that you would help us to see what your Word really teaches so we can understand what we should expect from you. Give me wisdom, give me clarity, give me power. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. So he starts, he says, Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Spurgeon in his book, Power in Prayer, notes that it may be a revealing exercise for some of you to find how often in Scripture we are told to pray. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, Psalms 50 says. Ye people, pour out your heart before him, Psalm 62. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near, Isaiah 55. Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open, Matthew 7. Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation, Mark 14. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5. Come boldly into the throne of grace, Hebrews 4. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you, James 4. Continue in prayer, Colossians 4. And then he says, I need not multiply what I could not possibly exhaust. I simply pick two or three out of this great bag of pearls. One of the most repeated things we're told in the Bible is to call upon God, to seek Him, to pray. And yet I wonder how many of us take seriously those charges. Why do we ask? He comes and He says, ask. Why? Because asking requires several things. First, asking recognizes that I have a need that I cannot meet. See, it recognizes that, that there is a need I have that I can't meet. We live in a culture that has taught us to be self-sufficient. We live out west, right? The people that came out here originally came out here because they wanted the freedom. They would make their own lives. They would do it themselves. They would pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They didn't want to ask anybody for anything. And we embrace this idea. But prayer requires recognizing that I have a need I cannot meet. It also requires trusting in the ability and willingness of another to meet that need. See, I don't ask someone for help if I don't think they can help me. Thirdly, it requires humbling myself to seek the need of another. Prayer requires, requires recognizing that I cannot meet all my needs. Trusting in the ability and willingness of another to meet those needs. And then humbling myself to seek the aid of another. You know, one of the things that really irks me is when people don't come out and ask. They just beat around the bush. You remember, they just want to hint. They don't want to ask. It's like, just, just ask, right? They're like, well, I really wish, you know... Ask. Why don't we ask? We don't want to humble ourselves. But you know what? The Bible, Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. And we talked about those are beggars, those who recognize their only hope is to beg. The Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The Bible offers nothing to the proud man or woman. And this is one of the things that hinders us in our prayer. Why don't we ask? Someone said prayer is the result when a great sense of need and helplessness meet a great sense of who God is. And when a great sense of need and helplessness meet a great sense of who God is, miracles happen. But why don't we pray? There's several things that keep us from going deeper in prayer beyond just a surface request or a prayer for the meal. The first, I think, for many of us, is the sneaky suspicion that prayer doesn't matter. It is easy to fall into a kind of fatalism that says, God's going to do what God's going to do. So we stop praying 
because we think nothing will change. There, there's this view today, a, a branch of Calvinism, that basically says the sovereignty of God means God has everything planned out. And, and, and everything that God wills is going to happen, and what He doesn't will is not going to happen. And there's this Christian fatalism. Are you aware that the Bible is very clear that the will of God does not always happen? The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. You know what we know from the Bible? Not everybody's going to get saved. But it is the will of God that everyone gets saved. The Bible says it is the will of God that you flee youthful lust. Does everybody flee youthful lust? No. In fact, a lot of people not fleeing youthful lust are not that youthful. <laughs> Let's be honest. There are quite a few things that the Bible talks about that God wills to happen that does not happen. So, so we've got to understand, don't bring this into prayer and take this fatalistic view of life that says everything that's going to happen, because a lot of people like that because then that frees us from any responsibility or choice. God is in control and He has given us a f the faculties to choose. And those choices have consequences. To me, the best definition of the sovereignty of God is in Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar rebels against God, his pride lifts up, and God rebukes him, and he comes back and he says, he says this about God, that he does whatever he wills in the kingdom of heaven. And there is none that can stay his hand or say, what are you doing? The sovereignty of God does not mean that everything that happens is what God would have chosen to happen. It does mean that whenever God decides to act, there is no one on earth that he has to get permission from. And there is no one on earth that can stop him. Congress can't. The White House can't. The United Nations can't. All the powers of Europe can't. If God wants to do something, he doesn't need anybody's permission or anybody's help. But you know what the Bible does make very clear? That oftentimes God does things that he otherwise might not have done had they not asked. Some will say, well, pastor, Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should repent. Read the whole passage. There, there's this guy, Balak, and he comes, and he comes to Balaam. And, and, and the prophet is asked to Get God to curse the children of Israel. The children of Israel have just left the promised land. And God promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses that God was going to deliver them to the promised land. And Balaam doesn't want them there, so he gets this prophet of God, Balaam, and he says, I will pay you to get God to curse Israel. And he goes and Balaam says, okay, I'll take your money and, and I'll go talk to God and see what we can do. And God sends this message. God came back and said, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? It's not saying that God never changes his mind or anything. God never says, I wasn't going to do it, but now it will. What he is saying is, God does not lie. When God makes a promise, He keeps His promises. And He's not like us. Sometimes we make a promise and then the circumstances change and we say, okay, I'm, I, I promised that, but that was before this happened. God does not lie. But you know what the Bible does say over and over? It says that there were things God will, is willing to do in response to prayer that He otherwise might not have done or would not have done. He was going to destroy the Sodom and Gomorrah. And through Abraham's prayer, God said if there were ten righteous, he would spare the city. God was going to destroy the Israelites for their rebellion. But in response to Moses' prayer, he spared them. God offers miraculous aid in response to Joshua's prayer. The people are often healed in Scripture who otherwise would not have been. The king of Israel is given 15 more years of life in response to his prayer. Do not allow Satan to convince you that, that the Bible teaches that God's going to do what he's going to do and it doesn't matter what we pray. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And I wonder how much of our culture, our families, our churches are struggling because we've accepted this passive view of life that says we don't have to do anything. 
when God keeps saying, ask, 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 ask. Secondly, I wonder if we've stopped praying because we fear we won't pray the right way. People say, well, pastor, I don't know the right words. I got news for you. There's nowhere in the Bible that tells me the right words or the right posture. The Bible tells me to come as one <clears throat> overwhelmed with needs. It tells me to come. I see in the Bible, I see a man coming for Jesus. His, his son is dying. His child's dying. And he comes to Jesus and says, Lord, kill my son. And Jesus says, if you believe, I will. And he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I see a woman come, a Samaritan woman, and, and she comes and her daughter has been suffering under these demonic possessions, demonization. And she begs and Jesus says, look, I'm come for the Jews. I'm not come to, to do miracles among the Samaritans and the rest of the world at this time. And he said, it's not fair to give what was intended for the children to the dogs. And she said, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumb of the table. I'm just needing the crumbs of your power. And Jesus says, go, your prayer is answered. Not because she got the right words, but because of her faith and her passion and her drive. Some struggle thinking God has more important things to do. There are more important needs to meet. There are more important people to deal with. One of the great things about serving an omnipotent God is that God's got enough power to deal with your problem and mine. The great thing about serving an infinite God is that He can give attention to each one of us as though there was only one of us. Six billion people can call to Him at the same time, and He can hear every one of us. And He is not limited to answer my prayers because He's heard yours. God doesn't come and say, you know, Whitney, I wish you had prayed before Dan did. But, but Whitney, Dan had a need, I met that, and now... I, you know, I can't help you this week. No! God is an infinite God. <clears throat> Sometimes we don't pray, I think often we don't pray, because we think we can handle things without God. We overestimate ourselves and underestimate our circumstances. I've read that the wisest of people make 7 out of 10 good choices. Think about that. If the wisest people make 7 out of 10, that means 30% of the decisions the wisest of us get wrong. Do you know the problem? You pay the consequences of all 10. And if the wisest are only making 7 out of 10, where does that leave the rest of us? You know what? There is no decision in my life I am qualified to make without God. Also, many of us struggle with the little voice inside of us that tells us we've got more important things to do than prayer. Prayer is good, we need to do it, but, but we've got the real life to get on with. I mean, Pastor, I've got a job, I've got a family, I've got all this going on. But you know what, I'm better off with Less time to get my work done in God's assistance than I am more time on my own. Think about how much things just in life are easier if you have help. You know, it, it, we set up in here every, every Saturday and we're grateful. We got several of our teenage guys that come and help. And I'm here, so I'm like, you know what? It'd take me a whole lot longer if I had to set this thing up by myself. Not to mention the back problems I'd have and all the other stuff. Think about how much quicker to saying, you know what, I'm better off waiting 30 minutes to get four people to come and help me than try to sit at the gym by myself. How much more is that true in life with an infinite God? You are better off with 30 minutes left less time to do the work of your world and have God's assistance than to have more time and less of God's assistance. Finally, most of us do not want to humble ourselves to ask. We just don't want to humble ourselves. But do you know what? 
God has never been robbed, swindled, or duped. He has never been tricked. He has never been fooled. He has never been manipulated. He has never been bribed. He has never been blackmailed. The treasures of heaven and the blessings of God are available only one way. We ask. And you know what? Some of us don't want to ask. We want to try to trick God. We want to try to manipulate God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. And you know what? Don't fool yourself into thinking that we earn God's blessings. That if I'm good enough, God will answer my prayer. Now don't be wrong. Sin hinders our prayer. But God's blessings do not come because He owes them to us. They come because He is a good, merciful God. And they come because we ask. The door of heaven has never been broken down and its lots have never been picked. The door of heaven only opens from the inside. Ask. Seek. What we need most, why does I seek? Because what we need most is not an answer to our prayers, but the presence of God. See, I'm not a Greek scholar. To be honest, I'm not any kind of scholar. But I'm really, really far away from being a Greek scholar. But fortunately, I have a computer program that is. And you know what those words, ask, seek, knock, they're in the imperative. So what they mean is keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And God tells us to seek. And you know why I believe oftentimes God tells us to seek? And God wants us to keep seeking and keep asking. Because what those needs, those desires do is they drive us to God. And do you know what the thing I need most in this life? It's not the gift. It's the giver. What I need most is not my prayers to be answered. What I need most is to draw near to God. And oftentimes, in our ignorance, we think we need the gift more than the giver. But God in His goodness knows that the greatest thing we need is not the gift. Think about Job. In one horrible short span of time, he goes from the richest man around with a great big family and good health to abject poverty, fatherless, and a broken health. And for the next 30 chapters in the book of Job, he's crying out to God. He's crying out to God, where are you? Why is this happening? And God even withdraws all sense of his presence. Job cannot feel the presence of God. Now, God's there. Job just doesn't know it. After 30 chapters, 30 some chapters, God comes back. And God reveals his presence to Job. And you know what's interesting? As we read that last part there, people often miss this. Later on, God's going to give Job his wealth back. He's going to give him more children. And we assume he's going to heal his health. But at this point in the story, none of those things have happened. Job simply seen God, and it's enough. See, oftentimes we don't realize what we need most is the presence of God. And so God tells us to seek. This requires two things, to seek the, the Greek word there means to seek in order to find by thinking, meditating, reasoning, inquiring. It means requires recognizing that I'm missing something or someone that I need. And so it, it requires a compelling sense of need that leads to a determination not to stop. And then third, he tells us to knock. Ask, seek, knock. This is the image Jesus gives Jesus does not say when it will be given, only that it will be given. He does not say when we will find, only that we will find. He does not say when it will be open, only that it will be open. So keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Ask bold prayers, pray bold prayers. Helen Rosevere was a missionary in the Congo of Africa in the 1940s. 
They worked in an orphanage there. And one, one night, a, a lady, woman came there, and there were medical missionaries there, and she was giving birth, and she was very sick, and they did everything they could to save her, but she died, and the baby was born premature. In the jungles of Africa there, there was no hospital around him. So trying to keep the baby warm was a very real concern. And what they would generally do is they would heat up these rubber water bottles and lay that beside the baby to keep it warm. Only in that climate, the, the rubber would crack and harden. And as the nurse was filling up the last water bottle, it broke. And she said, we don't have any more water bottles. What do we do? And so Helen said the only thing she needed to do is she said, one of the nurses, she said, your job today is to keep this baby warm. Get the baby as close as the fire as you can, and you sleep between the baby and the door to keep it as warm. And she went with the children at the orphan that day, and she would share with the ones who came. They had a prayer time, and she would share the needs, and she talked about there being no water bottles. And one of the little girls, a, a nine-year-old girl, Ruth, was in the front row. And, and, and Helen told her that this new baby was born and that her sister, her two-year-old sister, had just lost her mom. And one of the kids said, we should pray for water bottles. And Helen's like, where are we getting water bottles? We're in the middle of Africa. She had been there over four years and she had never received any kind of package. And she said the only way they would get water bottles is if someone had sent them. But if someone sent them from England, then it would take months before they would arrive and the baby would be dead. But the kids said, we need to pray for water bottles. And so she starts praying for a water bottle. And this little girl, Ruth, said, and that little, do that, that little girl needs a doll to know Jesus loves her. Let's pray for a doll too. So they prayed for a doll. The next day she's working and they call back and say that someone just dropped a pox a package off at the front door. She goes and gets the package and news spread through the compound. They didn't get mail off and then all the kids ran around and she starts opening the box and there were some clothes that the kids didn't find too interesting and then there were some raisins and nuts that they were excited about and then she reached in and she felt something and she pulled out a water bottle. The Sunday school class she had attended years before Months earlier, had sent the water bottle. When she pulled out the water bottle, the little girl Ruthie jumped up and said, if there's a water bottle in there, God must have sent the doll too. And she starts rummaging through the box, and sure enough, there's the doll. They prayed. What would happen if we trusted God enough to keep praying? You say, Pastor, that doesn't answer my concern. We prayed, and God didn't answer. We asked, and we sought, and we knocked, and the door stayed shut. Keep reading. Which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him. Now, we've already looked at some of the qualifications of this. And people talk about the, the sin. If, if I'm dwelling with sin in my life, the Bible says God will not hear my prayers for not asking the will of God. But I think there's something else going on here that's far more significant. Jesus does not say... So, so look at this for a second. Notice what he says. He says, which of you, if your son asked for bread would give him a stone. Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a serpent. Now, notice what Jesus does not say. Jesus doesn't say, which of you, if your children asked for bread, would not give him bread. Right? See, here's what Jesus is not saying. All of us know that our parents, a good parent doesn't give their kid everything their kid asked for. In fact, show me a parent that gives their children everything they'll ask for, they ask for. I'll show you someone who is decidedly not a good parent. Part of loving our children is having the wisdom to know what things they ask for is good for them and what is not. 
And you know what Jesus does not say? He does not say, which of you, if your son asked for bread, would not give him bread? He says, look, if your children ask for something bread, something good, you're not going to give them a stone. If they ask for a fish, you're not going to give them a serpent. Your Father in heaven is not going to give you something that harms you when you've asked for something good. He's not going to give you something worthless in response to your prayer for something good. See, just as Satan tempted Jesus to turn the stones into bread in Matthew 4, he does, so does he tempt us to view the bread God gives as stones. No matter how much it may be, seem to be a stone, we must trust God's Word that it is in fact His good, pleasing, and perfect plan. So you say, Pastor, we prayed and prayed and God didn't give us what we asked for. Have you ever considered that is because He loves you enough not to? You say, Pastor, what we asked for was good. Are you sure about that? There's an old story of a man, and he had one son, and they had a, a prize a stallion on their property on their farm there. And the hope was that one day they could pay and breed this, this stallion and make some money off of it. It was the prized horse in the village. And then one day, the horse left. The horse ran away. And all the people in the village came and said, Oh, this is good. This is horrible. This is such bad news. And the man responded, it's too soon to tell. Say only that the horse is not in the stable. That is all we know. The rest is judgment. If I've been cursed or blessed, how can you know now? Everybody said he's crazy. Obviously this is bad. You just lost your prized possession. But you know what happened about a week or two later? The stallion came back. And back with it, it brought about 12 or 13 wild horses. And you know what all the people in the village said? This is good news! This is great blessing! And you know what the man said? It's too soon to tell. Say only that the horse is back. State only that a dozen horses returned with him, but don't judge. How do you know if this is a blessing or not? We see only a fragment. Unless you know the whole story, how can you judge? You've only read one page of a book. How can you judge the whole book? You read only one word of a phrase. How can you understand the entire phrase? A few days later, the man's son decided to try to break one of the horses. And as he was doing that, he was thrown from the horse and he broke his leg. And everyone in the village came and said, Oh, this is horrible. This is bad news. You will not have your son to help work the farm. This is going to hurt your crops. This is horrible news. And you know what the man said? It's too soon to tell. All you can say is my son broke his leg. Whether it's good news or bad news, that's judgment. War broke out. The nation was invaded. All the young men in the area were asked to go to war. All except for the son with the broken leg. In a battle a few days later, nearly every man, young man that had gone in the village was either killed or severely wounded. And you know what? Everyone came to, the young man, to that man and said, you know what? This is good tidings. It's good news that your son wasn't there. And you know what the old man said? It's too soon to tell. It is impossible to talk with you. You draw conclusions. No one knows. If it's a blessing or a curse, it's too soon to tell. No one is wise enough to know. Only God. So you know what? Like some of you, I've lived long enough to see things that I thought would bring joy and happiness, bring heartache and pain. And I've lived long enough to see things that I thought were bad and horrible bring some of the greatest treasures and blessings of my life. And I'm realizing that I'm really not qualified to say what's good and what's not. See, faith not only believes 
that God has the power to give what I ask, but that he also has the wisdom to know when not to give what I ask. Let me read that again. Faith not only believes that God has the power to give what I ask, but that he also has the wisdom to know when not to give what I ask. See, are you sure what you ask for is good? And are you sure that it's good now? Some things may be good later that aren't good for us now. Remember, just as Satan tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread, he tempts us to view the bread God gives us as stones. No matter how much we seem, it may seem to be a stone, we must trust God's Word that it is in fact good, pleasing in His perfect plan. Let me ask you a question as we close. What have you stopped praying for? What have you stopped praying for? What is it that you used to pray for and God didn't answer so you quit? I wonder if we're not going to get to heaven and find a bunch of things that God was about to give and we quit asking. I heard a story of a pastor who had a parrot. And all the parrot would ever say was, let's pray, let's pray. After a while, I got tired of hearing the parrot saying, let's pray, let's pray. We heard about a deacon that had a parrot, a female parrot, and that parrot, all that parrot would say is, let's kiss, let's kiss. So they thought, you know, if we get the two together, maybe they'll teach each other something different to say. So they got them together, and the pastor's parrot, the, the male parrot said, let's pray, let's pray. And the female parrot said, let's kiss, let's kiss. And the pastor's parrot said, my prayers have been answered. I wonder how many of us have stopped praying before we got the answer. So let me just encourage you with this. Pray passionately. Pray passionately. Pray bold prayers. God's a big God. Let's pray big prayers. Pray small prayers. Pray small prayers. If it's big enough to be concern you, it's big enough to take to God. Pray small prayers. Fourthly, pray until God answers or stops you. Some of you are like, Pastor, I'm praying for this a long time. How long do I pray? Keep praying until God answers the prayer or until God tells you to stop praying. There's several times in Scripture, Paul's thorn in the flesh, Joshua after Ai, when God comes and says, look, stop praying. But until God tells you to stop, keep praying. I want to close with just a thought on prayer. <clears throat> it, there's a guy named, well, he was named Herbert Butterfield. He was a um, professor and vice chairman of history, and I believe it was at Princeton, Cambridge University. And he was a historian. He was also a traveling evangelist. But because he was a historian, he didn't want the fact that he was an evangelist known in his scholarly circles because he didn't want people to say that Christianity, his faith, was distorting his view of history. So he kind of kept the, few, the two separated for most of his career. And then in the late 1940s, he was invited to talk about Christianity and history. And so he gave lectures. It's a 268-page book. And then at the very end, he says something profound. It's like he's got this one thought he wanted to give. He didn't know where to give it. And so he gives this whole lecture. He's like, I really wanted to say this. And the very last thing he says is this. Listen to what he said. If I desired to say perhaps one thing that might be remembered for a while, I would say that sometime I wonder at dead of night whether during the next 50 years Protestantism may not be at a disadvantage because a few centuries ago it decided to get rid of monks. Since it followed that policy, a greater responsibility falls on us to give something of ourselves to contemplation and silence and prayer and listening to the still, small voice. I thought about that. 
he's giving these lectures late 1940s, I believe it was. And notice what, I, I, I used to never think much of monks. I used to think of monks as these people that retreated from the world, from the real struggles of the world. But what did monks do? They isolated themselves so they could spend time in prayer and reflection and listening to God. And Butterfield said, after long lectures on history and Christianity, he said, I, I wonder in the dead of night if in the next 50 years Christianity, Protestantism, might not be at a distant trouble, at a disadvantage, because 50 years ago, or several hundred years ago we got rid of monks. And I look at how our world has changed from 1945 over the past 70 years. I think he was right. And you know what he said? He said, because we followed this course of action, it is more important for each of us now to step in that gap, to intercede for our world, for our nation, for our families, for our churches, for our communities. I wonder what would happen if you and I spend as much time in prayer for our country as we do complaining about it. I wonder what would happen if we spend as much time interceding for the lost as we do complaining about it. What would happen if we took Jesus' word seriously and we became people of prayer? Father, we come before you today. I thank you, Lord, for your blessing. I thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray that you would be with us as a church, as individuals, that we would be people of prayer, that we would be people who come to you boldly before the throne of God with confidence, understanding that you are an awesome, infinite God. And yes, Lord, sometimes we may ask for things that are not good for us, are not right, and Lord, that's okay, because we have a God who has the wisdom and the love to know when to say no. And so, Lord, we come and we're going to boldly pray to you. We're going to boldly seek for you to do great things in and through us. Forgive us for our timidity. Forgive us for our pride. This is we can do so much without you when you have said in your word clearly that without me you can do nothing. Forgive us, Lord, for thinking we can build ministries and churches and families and marriages apart from you. Forgive us, Lord, we have sinned. But, Lord, we come and repent and we come and seek you. We ask this in Christ's name.